The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. continuing with our study on the book of Ezekiel and Ezekiel is now my favorite book in the Old Testament um, that I've enjoyed preparing and studying and reading and I think it's very exciting it's very applicable for today one of the most exciting things about Ezekiel um, well let me give you a little background a little history on Ezekiel this is in the Babylonian captivity, and we know that after the Babylonian captivity, then we have Nehemiah rebuilding the wall and uh, Zerubbabel and the t- temple being rebuilt and um, Ezra coming and teaching the people, and then they're brought back to their land, at least a remnant is. So what's happening right now in Ezekiel is you have Judah, which is now Israel, because remember the kingdom the kingdom was divided into Judah and Israel. Israel's already been carried away into captivity by the Assyrians, and so now we have sometimes it calls it the house of Israel in Ezekiel, and sometimes it calls it the house of Judah. But for our purposes for history, I'm going to call it Israel because I'm speaking of the land of Israel so we have Israel over here and the time period of Ezekiel takes place from 605 to 536 BC approximately and during this time there are three invasions by King Nebuchadnezzar into Judah into Israel and each time captives are carried away now this you know good king Josiah was one of my favorite kings in the the king's period but following him we had king Jehoiakim Jehoiachin and Zedekiah and they did not serve the Lord like their father so Under these kings that came after Josiah, we have the three invasions. Now, in Israel, during this whole time, we have the prophet Jeremiah. And often he is prophesying the same things that Ezekiel is prophesying. Now, in Babylon, Daniel was carried away with one group um, of captives, And then sometime after that, Ezekiel was carried away with the later group. There were three invasions, and after that, there was the fall of Jerusalem. The Jews were in exile for 70 years. And all this is taking place, and it's amazing that the things that Jeremiah and Ezekiel were prophesying were actually taking place before their eyes i mean it was uh what they prophesied it it wouldn't take 50 years or 100 years i mean it would happen right then and those israelites were one tough people so they were um god told ezekiel he was sending him to a rebellious people hard-hearted people slow to hear people and they certainly were Now, this morning, we're going to cover eight points. We're going to cover Ezekiel's call. Number two, Ezekiel's object lessons. Object lessons are good not only for Sunday school, they're good for adults, too. Three, idolatry in the temple. Four, the writer and inkhorn. Five, 
5, the glory departs. 6, God will restore. 7, judgment on Israel. And 8, judgment of the nations. To go back over them again, that's Ezekiel's call, Ezekiel's object lessons, three, idolatry in the temple, four, the rider and the inkhorn, five, the glory departs, six, God will restore, seven, judgment of Israel, and eight, judgment of the nations. Now, as we mentioned when we first started out on this study, that there are four main sections in Ezekiel. The first section, which is chapter 1, is the glory of God in the living creatures. So you could say the first section is glory. The second section that we we're teaching on today is judgment on Israel and the nations. This is the judgment section. The third section is recovery. And the fourth section is building. Now, as we mentioned, one of the key thoughts in this book is rebellion. The Israelites are called rebellious, and this is God speaking, Rebellious, transgressors, impudent, and hard-hearted. So, what did God do? That does not sound like a promising um, career calling to a prophet. <laughs> so God told Ezekiel not to be afraid of the people, not to be afraid of their words, and not to be afraid of the looks that they would give him. Now, they are also called briars, rebels, thorns, and scorpions. And God just openly warns Ezekiel about their hard hearts. He said, Ezekiel, they won't listen to you. So he must have done a fortifying internal work in Ezekiel um, to help him be a prophet during that time. And it says later on in Ezekiel, it says that they would come and listen to him and mock him. So um, then after his calling as a prophet, God said, I'm sending you as a watchman. If you don't warn them, you are guilty. Those very solemn calling. If you don't warn them, you will be held responsible. If you do warn them and they don't listen, then it's their sin. So this is how Ezekiel was charged and called by God. And he began his ministry as a priest because his father had been a priest. So Ezekiel was not only a prophet, he was a priest. and the very year he turned 30, which was the age a priest began priestly ministry, Isaiah, I mean, Ezekiel saw his first vision. And by the way, some of the things that Ezekiel saw, Isaiah also saw, and the Apostle John saw in the book of Revelation. Well, definitely hard-hearted children, God gave Ezekiel several object lessons to show them what was going to happen according to the words he was prophesying to them. In chapters 4 and 5, he has him stage the siege of Jerusalem. And remember, there were three invasions. After the third invasion, 
Jerusalem fell. This is when the temple was destroyed. This is when the Ark of the Covenant was lost. And ever since that time, it was lost. So in the 20 years that Ezekiel prophesied, all these things happened. So he was showing them Jerusalem is going to fall. And he was told to take a tile or a clay tablet and call it, before the people, call it Jerusalem. And then like playing soldiers, pretend like you're laying siege to it with an enemy camp set up and battering rams to break down the walls. And he acted this out before their eyes. And he said, this is going to happen. Jerusalem is going to fall. That armies are going to come. There's going to be a terrible siege that the people will have to go through. And, you know, in the siege, what they tried to do is was cut off their food and cut off their water, producing a terrible famine. And he warns them that fathers will eat their sons and sons will eat their fathers. It will be a terrible time. And he acted all that out in front of them. Then God had Ezekiel all tied up so that he couldn't move from one side to another, representing the city during the siege. Next, God told Ezekiel to lie on his left side for 390 days, a day for a year for Israel's sins all the way back to the year of Solomon's reign, it's thought. And then he was told to lie on his right side for 40 days, a day for a year, for the sins of the southern kingdom. You know, I think Ezekiel had to go through a little bit of suffering during this time, too, to make a point to a people who weren't going to listen anyway. And then Ezekiel's unappetizing dinner he told him to take a little bit of grains and make a limited amount of bread, have water measured out so you don't have enough to eat and you don't have enough to drink, and then cook that bread over cow dung and do this before all the people to represent what is going to happen and how abominable their sins are in my eyes. Now, what is the basis of God's judgment? And we do know that God is slow to judge and he's great in mercy. And so sometimes um, it can seem like a long time before the cup of iniquity becomes full. But at this point, the cup of iniquity of Israel had become full. Now, God's judgment on his people God judges on the basis of three principles, his glory, his holiness, and his righteousness. Now, in chapter 1, the vision Ezekiel saw of the glory of God highlighted three things. The throne represented God's righteousness. The fire signified God's holiness and the splendor was God's glory. Three colors were represented. The glory was glowing yellow. The fire was red, signifying God's holiness. And the throne's appearance was as a blue sapphire, symbolizing righteousness. And all these colors appear in the rainbow. So the rainbow then is speaking of glory, holiness, and righteousness. Now because of the idols in the temple, God withdrew his glory step by step, and that's covered in the book of Ezekiel. Now idolatry is versus God's glory. God first bases judgment upon his beat people based on idolatry. Now, we don't have many stone or metal or statues of idols in the modern world. But recently, in the last few years, since 2016, 
the ancient temple of Baal, the Arch of Palmyra, has been set up for short periods of time in cities across the globe. And I don't know if you saw a news story about this. It, it, it was not, it did not stay in one place long enough for people to, to catch wind of it. Since 2016, it's been set up in London, New York City, Dubai, Washington, D.C., Amsterdam, places in Syria, and other places all around the world. So it's amazing that in this day and age, we're seeing a resurgence of visual idolatry that we can see set up. And then, I don't know if you've read this, but um, many capitals allow some sort of Christmas or um, a menorah Christmas or um, the Jewish menorah to be set up over the holidays. Many of them will also allow a Baphomet, the, a statue of Satan, to be set up right in our state capitals. Um, the Bohemian Grove in Monte Rio, Monte Rio California, um, has a huge bohemian owl, they call it, that's like the, the statue of Moloch, has the, the arms, and between the arms there's a fiery pit underneath where they sacrificed infants in the Old Testament. And I don't know if they're actual um, human sacrifices there, but they're certainly, if not, they're symbolic sacrifices of drawing, dropping effigies of people down into that fire. And it's a very, very famous place, um, well attended by businessmen, bankers, celebrities and stars, journalists, politicians, including most of the presidents in modern history, presidents of the United States, have gone and spent time there. And so I think it's hitting closer to home. And then back during the last presidential campaign, there are politicians and people who set up um, ritual dinners. They called it spirit, cook, spirit cooking to summon demons to help in the um, polit last presidential campaign. So these things, and if I mentioned some names, you would recognize them. So we're not that we have not progressed out of open idolatry. Of course, this morning I'm more concerned with inward idolatry in the heart because we know God looks on the heart. Now, idolatry is a pretty horrible thing. It's like sexual sin. When you participate in idolatry, there's a seducing spirit attached to it with a pull toward that thing so we're not talking about something that's just you wanting something is you've actually allowed the attachment of evil spirits on it so it's based in lust and has an unclean pull that can be felt like titillation in the gut when you think of a person place or thing that you crave and it can be prayed through, and it can be broken. Idols do not have to be physical statues or images. So, unfortunately, we even have can have idols in the church and having to do with the church. Of course, you can have an you can make anything you want an idol in your life, anything that you crave, but. You can make the work of ministry. You can make your ministry an idol, the success of your ministry. You can make a position of leadership in the church an idol. Bible studies and gaining knowledge. Evangelistic crusades can become an idol. Exercising and excelling in your ministry gift can become an idol. Being praised for your performance becoming famous as a minister or singer or whatever, it can afflict Christians in the work having to do with the church just as well as people out in the world. Now, one thing that was said, I'm not sure who originally said this, but the thing that often became an idol in the past and still does become idol, an idol 
He said that ministers need to watch out for and not touch the girls, the gold, and the glory. And you can see why. I think that sexual sin is rampant in churches, even among leaders today, um, as, I mean, as well as the people, um, that money, skimming off, embezzling. Uh, we actually know of um, a church that was affected and a person who embezzled, I think it was $40,000 from, from a church. Um, and then the glory, wanting the stage, wanting to the acclaim to go to you instead of God. Now, Billy Graham and a number of other ministers, when when they were beginning their ministry, they got together and they agreed to hold one another accountable. Because I'll tell you what, you can sit here and think, I'd never fall into sin um, like that, wouldn't bother me. The devil's very tricky, and he knows just how to push, and he knows just how to set people up, and he's very patient. Now, point three, idolatry in the temple. And I want to read you uh, from chapter eight of Ezekiel. And when I really got to studying this, this was very shocking to me. Just, um, I hope it shocks you too. Then I looked, and there was a likeness like the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his waist and downward fire, and from his waist and upward like the appearance of brightness, like the color of amber. I'm starting in verse 2. And he stretched out the form of a hand and took me by a lock of my hair. This is Ezekiel. And the Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven and brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the north gate of the inner court, where the seat of the image of jealousy or image of anger was, which provokes to jealousy. And this was some idol. We don't know what the idol was, but this, the statue was set up inside the temple, not in the Holy of Holies, but at least in the most ho in, not in the holy of holies, but in the holy place. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, like the vision I saw in the plain. Furthermore, he said to me, Son of man, do you see what you're doing, what they are doing, the great abominations that the house of Israel commits here to make me go far away from my sanctuary? Now turn again, and you will see greater abominations. So he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, there was a hole in the wall. Then he said to me, Son of man, dig into the wall. And when I dug into the wall, there was a door. And he said, Go in, and see the wicked abominations which they are doing there. So I went in and saw, and there, on the walls, every sort of creeping thing, abominable beast, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed, drawn, on the walls of the temple. And there stood before them seventy men of the elders of the house of Israel, and in their midst stood Jezaniah, the son of Shaphan. Each man had a censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. They were worshiping these idols. Then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the room of his idols? For they say the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. And he said to me, turn again and you will see greater abominations that they are doing. So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house. And to my dismay, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz was um, an idol, a counterfeit messiah. It was believed that um, in the agricultural cycle that he died and was reborn, and that brought fertility and food, the growth of food and the harvest. He's resurrected in the winter, beginning the cycle again. It's a counterfeit of Jesus. Then the Lord said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? Turn again, and you will see greater abominations than these. So he brought me to the inner court of the Lord's house, and there at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about twenty-five men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they were worshiping the sun. Now, this was in a time when the glory was still there in the temple. <clears throat> 
you know you could feel the presence of God all around that place. And yet they dared to do this in the temple itself. Um, Recently, uh, in the last, maybe since 2005, they've been excavating the city of David, the old original city of David, which was the original Jerusalem. Um, It's here you have the Temple Mount and the walls of the temple up here. And then south on a ridge of land, there was a... um, Oh, a a relatively small piece of land of 15 to 20 acres. They estimate between 2,000 and 4,000 people could live there then. They've excavated this since we went to Israel. And I would love to go back and see this because they've actually found part of David's palace with the temple right behind and above David's palace. So you could look up and see the palace when you looked at day see behind the palace you could see the temple with the ark of the covenant and the glory still there and yet in this excavation of this small piece of ground so far over 1000 asherah this is the goddess of fertility and beauty over 1000 Asherah idols have already been found. Do you think idol worship was rampant in Israel during this time? Now also are given the example of dross versus God's holiness. Now God's people are called his treasure, his pure treasure, and are likened to pure gold and silver. And God's holiness cannot tolerate mixture and impurity. We know that Isaiah 59 2, sin separates us from God. God is too pure to look on evil. Now, God's holiness cannot tolerate dross, but dross, you know what dross is? You have some metal and you want to purify the metal. It talks about this in Malachi. Who can endure the day of his coming? He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. And then also Ezekiel twenty-two seventeen through 20 talks about the process of purifying. And what they do, they heat up gold or silver, precious metals, and as they heated it, this scum, a mixture of other metals and things, would rise to the surface, and they'd skim it off. Then they'd heat it up again and skim off the dross. The dross is all the bad stuff. God's holiness cannot tolerate dross. Dross is not just sin, but anything done in the flesh. The next is that Injustice and oppression are versus God's righteousness. God's actions stemming from his justice are his righteousness, his righteous deeds. We know God, that God is just in righteous and just and righteous in everything he does. But in Ezekiel's day, God's people were oppressing one another and even robbing them by engaging in unjust practices. Ezekiel twenty two twenty nine says, The people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, mistreated the poor and needy, and wrongfully oppressed the stranger. Now Leviticus nineteen thirty six in the message translation says, Don't cheat speaking to the business people, don't cheat when measuring length weight or quantity use honest scales and weights and measures so they were cheating people leviticus 535 says if one of your brethren becomes poor and falls into poverty among you then you shall help him like you would help a stranger or sojourner so that he may live peaceably with you And then we know, like in the book of Ruth, that God made provision for widows and and the poor. And she went into the field of Boaz and gleaned. This is a gleaning is what is left after the harvest has been gathered, gathered, what's left scattered on the ground, that the poor and widows can go in and take that to help them survive. Now, 
Do we have acts of unrighteousness taking place today in Christianity? Well, gossip and slander are rampant. Just uh, judging others and displaying it before the eyes of the world, such as on social media is common. Oh, people, don't air your dirty laundry publicly before the world. What, do you go out and try to win people to Jesus and then push people away from Jesus by your actions on social media? Committing the seven deadly seeds, the complaining, criticizing, controlling, coveting, comparing, concealing, and competing. I think we need some work too. It wasn't just in Ezekiel's day. Now, God judged the people in Israel and... He gave um, Ezekiel some actions to show them what God was going to do. God used the sword of Nebuchadnezzar, famine, sickness, and wild beasts to judge his people. Finally, Nebuchadnezzar burned the temple and carried the people away into captivity. And in chapter 33, one of the saddest books, saddest chapters, One of the saddest chapters in the Bible, Ezekiel 33, Jerusalem has fallen. Now, the reasons for the degradation want to go back to idolatry again. Ezekiel 14 is a book all about idolatry. 14.3, Son of Man, these men have set up idols in their heart. In verse 4, he said, if they come and ask anything of me, they're going to get the answer filtered through their idols. They won't hear a clear word. And the principle here is those who have idols in their heart but seek God won't be able to find him. See, we are not immune from the judgments against idolatry and actually If we have idols, the judgment is of our own making. Um, Jeremiah 29, 13, this was the verse. This is my life verse given to me by God when I was a baby Christian. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. With all your heart or wholeheartedly means there's no competition in your heart. An idol is competition in your heart. An idol takes up a place in your heart, possesses that place in your heart, so that you can't find God. God won't let himself be found because of idols. Anything we substitute for God is an idol. If we love any person, place, or thing, that's an idol. So, let me ask you this. What do you think about most of the time? What occupies your thoughts? If it's not Jesus most of the time, you might have something that you need to clean up in your life. Anything we love more than Jesus is an idol. Possessions, money, clothes, keeping up with the Joneses, entertainment, your husband, your wife, your children. Something we love more than God. The, in the letter to the Ephesian church in Revelation, we learned they did many good works, but they had left their first love. First love is wholehearted love. First love is all your heart. If we don't love the Lord with first love, then we have idols. Most believers have lost their first love today, if they have ever even had it. Many love doing ministry more than the Lord himself. Um, Pastoring a church, spiritual gifts, platform position, recognition, or claim some people are in love with entertainment more than the Lord. The second thing 
and the reason for degradation in Israel, and for us too, is association with the world. Israel formed attachments with the world and became just like the world. Third, acting like the world. Israel began to associate with the nations and they followed their manners and customs. Today we represent the Lord and we should be separated from the world. What does our outward appearance say about us? Have you seen videos of church services on YouTube with dancers up on the stage in sexy outfits with hot pants leading worship? It's shocking. Don't go looking for that sort of thing, but believe me, it's out there. Um... That's the same as what was happening in the temple in Ezekiel's day. What does how we live say about us? How we spend our money, how we live, how we dress, <clears throat> how we behave towards others. Jesus said the world would know us by our love. Do people see love when they look at you? So the next point is God was measuring. He was assessing what was going on. This is chapter 9 of Ezekiel. And it said, He called out in my hearing with a loud voice, saying, Let those who have charge of, over the city draw near, each with a weapon in their hand. And six, six men came from the direction of the upper gate with battle axes in their hands. One man among them was clothed with linen and a rider's ink horn at his side. They went in and stood beside the bronze altar. And the man clothed with linen was told, Go and put a mark on the forehead of those who sigh and grieve because of these abominations. The ones who are mourning, blessed are those who mourn, who are mourning over these things. And the ones who were marked were marked with a Hebrew tav, which in the ancient Hebrew was the sign of a cross on their foreheads. And he said, these will be protected in all the things that are going to happen. They will not be touched by the judgment. Now at this point, with the Man with the writer's inkhorn, which is a Christophany, a pre-incarnate visitation from Jesus himself. At this point, the glory of God has gone up from the cherubim and is now has now come to the threshold of the house. The mark was placed on the foreheads, and then judgment begins at the house of the Lord. 1 Peter 4.17 For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And we've had prophets speaking that same thing that we are to, are to expect God to do some things. There will be a cleansing of God's temple in our day and there will be a dealing with the nations. I think the book of Ezekiel is very appropriate for the time we're living in. Ezekiel eleven twenty two through 23. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city up to the mountain, the Mount of Olives, which is on the east side of the city, and returned to the heavens. The glory never came back to the temple, and the Ark of the Covenant was never recovered. The next time the glory came was in Jesus the Messiah. And it says, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus, our Messiah. Now chapter 11. There is hope God will restore. It tells us that a remnant will be saved and God will give them a new heart and new spirit. Also that God will give the land of Israel back to them. And we know that a remnant returned to Israel 
under Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, and Ezra 400 years before Jesus. But it wasn't all the captives. Not all of the captives came back. A remnant came back. Seven is the judgment of Israel. Chapters 2 through 24 covers God's judgment on Israel. And in chapters 25 through 32, we see God's judgment on the Gentile nations. God uses the Gentile nations as his instrument to judge his people and then turns right around and judges the Gentile nations for what they've done. This corresponds to the principle of the book of Revelation in 1 Peter 4.17 that judgment begins with God's people. And we know that God has had us on a quest to get our hearts purified before the Lord because I think most of us who are listening to this message, our heart is for the Lord and we want him more than anything else. That testifies of being a remnant. And, you know, we can read the Old Testament and we can find fault with Israel, but the church has been no better than Israel as far as being degraded and turning away from God. Now, what is the position of God's people? What is the position of those people that God has chosen, both Israel and the church, have rights, privileges, and are given special standing before God. Both Israel and the church are God's elect, his chosen people. Israel was called God's vine. Jesus tells us to abide in the vine. As we abide in the divine, divine life flows into the branches for fruit-bearing, and grapes grow on the branches. And the grapes produce wine to bring cheer to God and man. There's a purpose for it. God called Israel his wife. Jesus calls the church his bride, speaking of love, faithfulness, and satisfaction. Israel was called God's flock. We are also called God's flock, flock, and Jesus is the shepherd of the church today. And we are also called God's precious treasure. Exodus 19.5 God spoke to Israel and said, If you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my special treasure from among all peoples. But there were some conditions on that. To obey my voice and keep my covenant. And Matthew 13.44 The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid and for joy over it he goes and sells all he has and buys that field. We were purchased by Jesus. So I think that we can see where we are. I believe that we're coming under the scrutiny of God now in a particular way. And I believe that there will be a separation. Um, Carol Arnott, John Arnott of the Toronto Blessing, um, had a dream and saw that happen and saw the remnant run to God into the glory and the light. And then a great number left and went out into the darkness and she was so it impacted her so much when she told the dream she was weeping so we want to be those people who draw close to God and get prepared for him it talks about and in Revelation it says I saw the new New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven and this is the bride and the bride has made herself ready So there's a work we need to do in ourselves. Now the judgment of the nations. There are seven nations surrounding Jerusalem that are mentioned for judgment in Ezekiel. They're representative nations, though. It's like the seven letters to the churches in the book of Revelation were representative. It's not 
okay, we, you know, Jesus didn't say anything to us. You know, it's a long time since he spoke to the Apostle John, so we're okay. No, those churches are representative, and these nations are representative of all nations. And in Ezekiel, they're divide, it's divided into three categories. This is chapters 25 through 32 of Ezekiel. And the first grouping is Ammon, Moab, Edom, and Philistia. That's Ammon, Moab, Edom, and Philistia. There's a second grouping that are mentioned together. This is Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon. And the third is Egypt that stands by itself. Ezekiel saw this in three different visions according to these groupings and this order. Do you need me to repeat um, the first Ammon, Moab, Edom, and Philistia, first group, Tyre and Sidon, the second group, and Egypt stands by itself. Now, this is cool, right? This is no longer judgment in the house of God. You know, we can just step back and look at this objectively because this doesn't apply to us, right? Wrong. It does because these are these are types that absolutely apply to the church today. Now, we'll look at Ammon and Moab together and then Edom and Philistia together. Ammon and Moab, um, the founders of these nations were the were the products of incest between Lot and his two daughters. This action was evil and repulsive. Now, we know that things get passed down in lines, right? Family lines and national lines. In Ezekiel, the Ammonites were pleased when the temple of God was defiled. They were also happy when the land itself was devastated. And when the children of Israel were carried off captives, the Ammonites were glad. Now, Ammonites are haters of Messiah, believers in Messiah, and the church today. In the first centuries AD, the Roman Empire was a type of Ammonite. And on earth today, many individuals who hate Jesus... His standards of morality, Christians, biblical Christianity, the Jewish people, and the church are types of Ammonites. They want us to be nice, quiet people and hide away in our church buildings so we won't see or hear you, so we can forget about you. That's what the Ammonites want. Fortunately, we don't have too many people Ammonitish people come into our churches. If they did come into our churches, they would come in with an agenda to destroy. Um, then Moab, the Moabites were delighted when Israel became just like the other nations. See, they're not better than us. They're not different from us. They do all the rotten, terrible things that we do. So um, God's people were no longer separate or distinguishable, disting distinguishable people. The emperor the Emperor Constantine functioned as a Moabite, welcomed the church, made it the state religion, and the result was the church became just like the world at that time. In our day, the Moabites have come into the fold of the church trying to make the church like the world. Um, in the 70s, for example, many churches embraced liberation theology, which is communism, socialism. It was openly taught from the pulpit in the church I grew up in. Finally, it got my father so upset, he stopped going to church. So a little extreme. He could have just gone to another church to preach the right things. But anyway, um, so now the church has embraced many other theologies and and worldly philosophies, including sexual atheism. This is probably one of the most common. How about people and openly immoral people being given positions as bishops of churches or um, 
pastors of churches. This is happening all over the place. I mean, it's very common. Sexual atheism is common among our young people who say, oh, the Bible's fine except all of that sexual stuff. I just do what I want. That doesn't apply in this day and age. That doesn't apply in this world. And I, I ran across um, an article written by a man who had pastored up in New England, up in Massachusetts, and he t tells young people, premarital sex is fine. After all, you're going to marry that person. Well, you know, there really isn't premarital sex. That's not, that was a euphemism made up. What he's calling premarital sex, the Bible calls fornication. And it's not all right before marriage. So, but um, I'm sure he counsels with a lot of young people and makes them comfortable in their sin. Many young people don't even believe the standards of the Bible apply anymore. That, oh, the world has changed. That's old-fashioned. Pick and choose the parts of Scripture they like and reject the rest. Now, Edom and Philistia, Edom was closely related to Israel. Edom was the grandson of Esau, Jacob's brother. Edom represents our old man. Now, what is our old man? Um, you can tell the old man real easily because Galatians 5, 19 through 21 gives um, a list. The works of the flesh are evident, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, and so forth and so on. The old man, our jealousies, our angers, that comes from the old man. Now, Israel at that time represented the new man. We now know that through Jesus that we put off the old man and put on the new man, which is Jesus. Now, Philistia, which is very close in concept to Eden, represents the natural man. We've talked um, in this church often about good, but not God. Our natural man is more subtle than the old man. It's made up of our preferences, opinions, human wisdom, and our good ideas apart from God. A lot in the church is done based on good ideas. The trouble is it's based on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So God is not in it. Now, Tyre and Sidon, oh, by the way, you see any old man new or um, natural man taking place in our churches today? It's very common, and we know that Jesus cannot build with anything except his life in us, so the old man and the natural man causes lots of damage in our church fellowships. Now, Tyre and Sidon, Tyre was only concerned with gaining money and riches, and they were friends with the world. And Sidon was pretty much the same. Ezekiel says that Sidon was a pricking briar and a painful thorn. Well, kind of the opposite of a vine producing grapes would be a pricking briar and a painful thorn causing damage instead of producing life. And bri briars and thorns choke out the growth of life in our churches. How about schisms, um, divisions, fighting, um, jockeying for position, all those things that come from the old man and the natural man are destructive to our churches. When what does Jesus want? Jesus prayed a whole long prayer for unity in our churches. And that unity is only through a spiritual unity brought about by the Holy Spirit, the opposite of the old man and the natural man. Now, Egypt represents the resourcefulness of man apart from God. Now, in Egypt, because of the Nile River, they didn't have to depend on the rain. Because of their natural resources, they were supplied with what they needed. They also had a powerful army for protection. In times of famine, people went from other nations went to Egypt for food. At times, the Israelites fled to Egypt for protection and failed to trust God. 
we know that in the book of Ruth, that Naomi and her husband went, to, they left Bethlehem, the house of bread, and went to eat and went to Moab for food, went to another nation for food. This is the same, the same principle. And you know, there are plenty of people that stayed in Israel, stayed in Bethlehem, and they didn't starve to death. Now, we can see how these kinds of people damage our churches, but what we need to look at is where do we let our old man take over? Where do we go with our natural man and go with our own preferences and opinions? I think God is bringing us to a time where he can and will be found by us. In Jeremiah 29, 13, if you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. I know that's what I want to do, and I know that's what I want more than anything else on this earth, because to tell you the truth, Without that, what do you have? If you lose God and gain the world, what do you have? I've told God that if having you meant that you would put me in a little room and just have me pray all day and be with you and be away from other people and we, there would no longer be a church. There would no longer be a ministry. But I had you, I would have everything. And there's actually a fear in my heart to, you know, like Esau in the Bible traded his birthright for a bowl of beans. And I said, God, I don't want any bowls of beans. I give you permission I ask you to be ruthless and relentless with me. I don't want any seducing spirits in my heart. That's why God called it, um, called Israel a whore and a harlot. He called it fornication. I don't want any of that in my heart that will separate me from you because nothing is important in this world except you. One time Dennis and I went to the mall and God kind of lifted me out of it and um, you know the Pilgrim's Progress that that little old book that was that's been so greatly loved he showed he showed the pilgrim in that book how empty the world was and I saw how empty the malls and entertainment and the glitter and everything was and how it's 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 like a counterfeit world it's like another matrix, and we want to be lifted up so that we become heavenly people and are certainly our hearts out of this world. We don't want our heart tied to this world. Oh, God, make us a heavenly people. Make us a heavenly people. Now, we're going to be covering the third section which is recovery by life, how God recovers and brings restoration to his remnant and defeats evil in the third section that we will cover next time. And then in the fourth section, it's how God builds and how God will be building his church today. And the man who measures for that is the man in Ezekiel's vision who measures the house of God. Sections 3 and 4 give hope for Israel, the nations, and all creation. And I would add hope for the church. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.